Good afternoon. My name is Caitlin. I would like to welcome you to the Active Doctor September webinar, Preparing for Cold and Flu Season. Today, we will discuss identifying the symptoms of a cold versus the symptoms of a flu and other respiratory illnesses, tips for staying healthy and avoiding the germs that cause colds, and how you can treat your cold if you do get sick. Today's speaker is clinical assistant professor from Georgetown University and active doctor's online medical director, Dr. Howard Zahalski. Dr. Zahalski, welcome. Thank you very much, Caitlin, and I'm glad to be talking about this. This is one of my favorite topics because coming to the doctor for colds, flu, and other respiratory infections is probably the single greatest cause of doctor's visits, especially over the winter months. Um, that an internal medicine physician like myself sees. So the first thing that we have to do is distinguish the cold versus the flu versus other bacterial infections. By bacterial infections, I mean such diseases as sinus infections, bronchitis, and pneumonia. And we want to know when is it more serious, when is it the flu, and when is it, as the screen says, just a cold. And if we go on to the next slide, we'll be able to go through some of the differences between those conditions. So here are some unhappy people with various infections. And by infections, I mean everything from a viral infection, such as a cold or the flu, to a bacterial infection. And they're all very unhappy. So when, if you're one of these people, do you think that you have something that you need to get to the doctor? And when might it be just a cold? So I'm going to go through some of the most common diagnoses that doctors see in their practices and help you to figure out do you need to rush to the doctor or not. The first thing I want to talk about is the flu. The flu is a viral infection. Um, as a viral infection, um, it is spread by a bacteria called influenza. That's how the flu gets its name. There are a hundred different types of influenza. Each one slightly different from the others. If you have the flu, you generally are going to have a temperature of greater than 101.5 Fahrenheit. You're going to feel crummy all over. It's not going to be a local problem isolated to your nose or your throat or even your lungs. Your whole body is going to ache. Another classic thing that you get with the flu is that you need to have had sick contacts or been somewhere where you could have been exposed to sick contacts. If someone you know, someone at work has the flu, then you're going to get the flu. Um, if you just went on a plane ride and there were several people coughing, you're going to be at risk of the flu. If you've been living on the top of a mountain by yourself for three months, then you, no matter how sick you get, probably don't have the flu because you have to catch the flu from somewhere, someone else. The next infection that I want to talk about is a sinus infection. I get a lot of people coming into my office saying they have a sinus infection. There are three classic findings in a sinus infection. You have to have a temperature of greater than 101. You have to have tender sinuses. Now, you see that top woman in this picture. She's kind of holding around her nose with the tissue. I get a lot of people who say, oh, yeah, in that area, it's really tight. It really hurts. That's not actually where your sinuses are. Your sinuses are your cheekbones, where you feel the prominence of your cheekbones, and your forehead. To have a real sinus infection, you need to be tender. When you push it, it really hurts. Not like a little sore, but literally like a toothache when you push on one of your four sinuses. People don't get four sinus infections at the same time. It's kind of like saying that you got an ingrown nail on both thumbs and both toenails at the same time. It just doesn't happen. So if your whole face is sore, it's not a sinus infection. It's got to be one of your four sinuses. And the third element is swollen lymph nodes in your neck. Generally speaking, you have to have two out of the three of them in order to think that you actually have a sinus infection. Then you have the girl at the bottom right. She might have bronchitis or pneumonia, a lower respiratory infection as opposed to upper. These people usually do not have sinus symptoms. If your sinuses are congested and you're coughing, it's probably not bronchitis or pneumonia. You generally are short of breath, and when the doctor listens to your lungs, they're going to hear wheezes or crackling sounds. And 
you usually have a temperature of over 101 again. Just as a side note, sinus infections, bronchitis, and pneumonia are not contagious. If, you have, if your entire family has been sick and you get ill and you think you have sinus infection, bronchitis, or pneumonia, you probably don't because bacterial infections are not contagious. It's like saying, again, imagine you have an infected, ingrown toenail. If someone else touches you, they're not going to get an infected, ingrown toenail. You're smart enough to know that that just doesn't happen. Bacterial infections are caused by bacteria, which naturally cover your entire body and are in your lungs and are in your sinuses at all times. They start for essentially no good reason, and you're not more likely to get one of those because someone else is sick. If you think you caught it from somewhere, someone else, it's probably not a bacterial infection. So when is it just a cold? If you have a cold, you're going to usually have a temperature of less than 101. You're much more likely to have been in contact with someone else who was sick, and you're likely to be coughing up phlegm. Now, that's the mucus maximus in the bottom center here. I get a lot of people in my office who come in and say, but doctor, it has to be a bacterial infection because I'm coughing up green or yellow phlegm. Secret doctor secret. The color of the phlegm doesn't matter. You can cough up green and yellow phlegm in bad allergies, believe it or not. You can certainly cough up green and yellow phlegm in a cold, and you can certainly cough up green and yellow phlegm in other non-bacterial conditions that don't need antibiotics. What the green and yellow phlegm, if you have a quote-unquote cold, is, is this green and yellow snot that's draining down the back of your throat. As gross as that sounds, you have to understand that with a cold, you can cough up some really disgusting stuff, and it's usually not coming from your lungs. It's usually coming from your nose and the color of the phlegm is not all important. Now, I do hear a lot of people who come into my office and say, but doctor, I only have a temperature of 99, but that's a fever for me. My temperature usually runs at 97, not 98.6 like everybody else. Well, most people don't run at 98.6. 98.6 is actually the upper limit of what we call normal. Most people actually run at about 97. The viruses and the bacteria don't care. The viruses and the bacteria love 97. They love 98, and they love 99. If you have a serious infection, it doesn't matter what you usually like, your body will heat yourself up to 101 or higher to kill a serious infection. If it doesn't do that, then it's not usually a serious infection. It's much more likely to be a cold. So let's go on to the next slide. So when is cold and flu season? The most common period is probably the January to February time frame. The earliest that people usually get the flu is somewhere around late October, and the flu is generally gone by May. This isn't at all surprising. As I said, the flu likes a very specific temperature. Most viruses have a, have a temperature preference. It's why people get less ill in the summer. Part of getting less ill in the summer is you're much less likely to be inside and sharing germs. You're going to be outside and playing. But even in, let's say, a nursing home where everyone is inside all the time, you're much less likely to get ill in the summer. And the reason is the flu virus hates warm weather. So if you get sick in June, July, August, into September, I can be pretty sure, sight unseen, that it's not the flu because the flu just doesn't like that kind of weather outside. The other thing is that the flu, usually because of geographic idiosyncrasies, usually starts in Asia. So this is actually how we make our flu shots, which we'll get to a little later. The flu shot is based on what flu viruses are popular that year in Asia. But then it tends to move from west to east around the globe. So you're going to see it in Asia, and then it will probably move to California, and then it moves to the east coast of the United States. 
So if there's no flu outbreak yet in California, then in New York and Miami and Virginia, where I'm located in, you're probably not actually suffering from the flu. Let's go on to the next slide. So how are we going to prevent the cold and flu? It is, let's say it is the winter, you are inside, you're around a lot of people who have the potential to be sick, maybe you, you fly a lot for work. How are you going to keep yourself safe? And the best way to keep yourself safe is shown on the next slide. Most of these cold and flu germs, they live on your hands. Every time you sneeze into your hand and you wipe your nose, every time you take a, take a little carrot and you stick it in your mouth and a little of your saliva gets on your fingers, even if you can't see the moisture there, the cold and the flu germs are living on your hands. And then you shake someone's hands or you open a door that they just opened. And the best way to keep safe from the cold and flu is really the simplest way, careful hand washing. Now when I say hand washing, I know a lot of people who carry those little jars of Purell around with them everywhere they can in their pocket. Those are good, they contain alcohol, which viruses generally don't like, but it's hard to get them into every nook and cranny of your hand. Hand washing with soap and water where you actually run the water over your hand and the friction of actually rubbing your hands against each other is much more effective at removing those germs. So if at all possible, if you're washing your hands, lean towards the soap and water with a sink rather than the Purell. But sometimes hand washing isn't enough. And for something as serious as the flu, sometimes you have to be more proactive. And that's where the flu shot comes in. Let's go on to the next slide and we'll talk about the flu shot. So get your flu shot. It is very important for people to get their flu shots. The most important people to get the flu shots are young children who may not have as good an immune system, older people who may have more serious medical conditions, anyone with any lung or heart problems who are gonna have more trouble fighting off the flu, and what I will call essential personnel, especially doctors, nurses, people who are going to need to be working with sick people. Now, a lot of people complain, well, I got the flu shot and I still got the flu. It is true, if you get one dose of the flu shot, your chance of being immune from the flu is only about 80%. You would have to get two or more flu shots in order to guarantee being immune from the flu. And it's just not practical each year to give three spaced out flu shots. That's why when we're treating other viruses like let's say polio or measles or mumps or rubella, you give children the, flu the vaccine spaced over time over a long period to make sure that they're immune. Some people can get the flu shot and still not build up immunity. Also, as I said, there's over a hundred different types of flu virus out there. Actually right at about a hundred types of flu virus out there. And we base what viruses are in the shot based on what viruses are popular in Asia the year that we're developing the flu shot. Sometimes we get it wrong. Sometimes the virus that outbreaks in Asia turns out not to be the flu virus strain that it attacks the United States that year. And that's happened a couple of times, in which case nobody has good immunity with the flu shot. But more often than not, we get it right. We can only put three or four versions of the flu in each shot. So even if you get the shot, and even if you've got it, let's say, three years in a row, it doesn't mean that you're going to necessarily be immune to whatever flu virus comes out. But there is some overlap. So even if we make a mistake and put the wrong strains of the viruses in this year's shot, if you've been getting regular flu shots, even if you haven't been vaccinated against that strain, the odds that you still carry some immunity for a similar strain are actually pretty good. So not only getting each year's flu shot, but getting them on a regular basis will mean that you can 
be probably less susceptible to a flu strain even if you haven't been specifically vaccinated against that exact strain. All right, so let's go on to the next slide. So those are some good ways to prevent the cold and the flu, but what do you do if you're unlucky, you got the wrong vaccine, you missed your flu shot this year, or you just managed to pick up a cold? How are we going to treat colds in particular and even then the flu? So we're going to start with colds on the next slide. So this is what the typical pharmacy aisle of cold medicines look like. As you can see, there are hundreds of different combinations and individual medicines to choose from. How do you decide which of these is right for you? Well, the first step if you have a cold, the most significant symptom, is usually the nasal congestion. The nasal congestion can cause problems. It can make it more difficult to breathe. It can get in the way of your sleep. It can cause your ears to congest and even sometimes lead to ear and or sinus infections. So a good decongestant is important. Personally, I recommend pseudoephedrine. Pseudoephedrine is what used to be called Sudafed and you now have to go to the pharmacy counter to actually requ request the medicine even though it is not a prescription. This is because if you take large quantities of pseudoephedrine, you can turn it into crystal meth, so they've put some restrictions on it. The current medicine in Sudafed, which is now called Sudafed PE, is something called phenylephrine. In my personal opinion, it is essentially useless. So if you are buying the Sudafed PE over the counter that you don't need to go to the pharmacist's desk for, you're essentially wasting your money. However, there's a problem with decongestants. They can boost your blood pressure, they can increase your heart rate, and for people with high blood pressure or other cardiac conditions, they can be a very bad idea. So although it is important and can be very symptomatically helpful to use decongestants, you have to be careful if you have other medical conditions. The next thing I would recommend is a cough suppressant, my favorite being dextromethorphan. Dextromethorphan is the main ingredient in such medicines as Robitussin DM or VIX 44 D. Any cough medicine that has a D in the title usually has dextromethorphan. Dextromethorphan is an excellent cough suppressant. But I get a lot of people in my office who say, well, I shouldn't take a cough suppressant because I want to get the phlegm up. That's an old wives' tale. You don't want to get the phlegm up. You want to leave the phlegm down. Trust me, your body will take care of the phlegm just fine. However, if you cough a lot when you have the cold, or the flu for that matter, you're going to scrape up the inside of your throat. That's going to then essentially scab up as you're getting better, which is going to tickle your throat which is going to make you cough, which is going to make you tear up your throat again, which is going to scab, which is going to tickle your throat again. And you get where I'm going with this. This is why people end up coughing for weeks after they have just a simple cold because they didn't use enough cough suppressant. If you're coughing badly with a cold, I very much recommend cough suppressants to avoid that lingering cough that will last after you have a cold. The next ingredient that you see in a lot of medications is guafenicin, also known by the brand name Mucinex. This is supposed to loosen up the phlegm. I'm actually not a big fan of guafenicin, certainly not by itself. The reason being, you have all that congested snot in your nose, and if you loosen it up, you know where it's all going? It's all going to drip right down the back of your throat into your lungs. And then you're going to cough, and then you're going to be coughing more, and you're going to cough up this loose snot, which is going to look green and yellow. So besides for the fact that it causes a lot of panic in my patients because they actually cough more when they use the guafenicin, it doesn't make you better any quicker. If There are some medicines, again, Robitussin DM, for instance, that have guafenicin mixed with a cough suppressant. That should be fine, but I really prefer the dextromethorphan part of that combination much better than the mucinex, the guafenicin part. 
Another ingredient that's found in a lot of these over-the-counter cold medicines is an antihistamine. You'll usually find either diphenhydramine or um, bromocryptine in a lot of these medications. Stay away from those if you can. They advertise them on the package as relieving congestion. They actually do nothing for congestion for a cold or the flu. All they do, and I promise all they do, is treat allergic nasal congestion. So why do they put them in cold remedies? Because they put you to sleep. They're very, very sedating. And it is very much true that if you're sick with the cold or the flu, there's worse things than falling asleep for the next couple of days. But if you want to actually try and be productive while you have a cold or even the flu, I would stay away from the antihistamine containing combination medications and stick with the ones that don't have that in, unless it's bedtime and you're actually looking for something that will knock you out and help you get a good night's rest. A final over-the-counter medication that I want to touch on is zinc. There's a lot of medications out there right now that include zinc in them, and zinc has been shown to actually inhibit the growth of the cold virus and can speed up the cure of the cold virus. However, there's a big problem. In order to get the concentration of zinc in your nose that you need to actually fight the cold virus, you have to get toxic levels of zinc in your nose. There used to be nose sprays that contained enough zinc to speed up the cure of the cold virus. They were pulled off the market because they were actually destroying nerves in people's nose and inhibiting their sense of smell. So now there are other concentrations that they're selling that don't do that, that don't actually have enough zinc to actually hurt your sense of smell. The problem is they no longer have enough zinc in them to actually do any good for the cold virus. So although zinc is an interesting thought, the ones that you're now buying over the counter, the, the cold remedies that contain zinc are probably useless. All right, so that's enough of the over-the-counter treatments for the colds. Let's go on to what you would do for the flu. So the main medicine that we use to treat the flu once you get it is called Tamiflu. You take it twice a day for five days. It is not a cure for the flu by any stretch. It will slightly shorten the course of the flu. A bad case of the flu usually lasts for seven to ten days of high fevers. Taking Tamiflu will shorten that by two, maybe three days, and will slightly decrease the intensity over the rest of the course of the flu. It's not going to be like an antibiotic, again, for an ingrown toenail, that after the first or second day, all of a sudden everything is feeling completely better. A catch with Tamiflu is it has to be started within 48 hours of the onset of symptoms to be anywhere close to effective. So if you think you have the flu, this is actually a good reason to rush to your doctor. Now going back to the beginning, when should you think you have the flu? If you know that you've been in contact with someone with the flu, if it's the right time of the year for the flu, if you've been in a big public place where you could, could have been exposed to the flu, and you have a temperature of over 101, and you're having respiratory symptoms. That would be a good time to rush to the doctor. Don't delay. Don't say, let's see how I'm feeling in a couple days, because if you wait two days, once you're having those symptoms, your doctor's not going to be able to do anything for you for the flu, other than, say, take some Tylenol for the aches and to bring down the temperature. Let's go on to the next slide. So this is what everyone actually comes to see me for when they have these symptoms. Everyone wants antibiotics, and in particular, azithromycin, also known as the z pack is a very popular antibiotic that people want. Antibiotics do absolutely nothing for a cold, and they do absolutely nothing for the flu. As I went over early on, if you actually have symptoms of bronchitis or pneumonia, if you're short of breath, if your lungs sound wheezy or crackly, yes, that's a good reason to consider antibiotics. If you actually think you have a sinus infection or your doctor thinks you do because you have swollen lymph nodes, a fever of over 101, and tenderness in one specific sinus, that's a good reason to give antibiotics. 
But if you have a temperature of 99.8, even if that's high for you, and are achy and are sniffly and have been sick for a day and a half, you should not be taking antibiotics. Now, an unfortunate problem with some antibiotics, especially Zithromax, is it actually has some anti-inflammatory properties. What that means is it just reduces inflammation in your body beyond the bacteria-killing properties. So despite the fact that I just said it's not the right medicine for a cold or the flu, if you take it for the cold or a flu, it will actually make you feel a little better, which makes you think next time you get a cold, wow, it must have actually been a sinus infection because the antibiotics made me feel better. And you go to the doctor next time when you get sick a few months later, I need those antibiotics again. I have another sinus infection. On one hand, you say, well, what's the harm in that? If it actually makes you feel better and get, um, and get you back on your feet, why not give it? And the reason is because we only have so many antibiotics and we're running out of antibiotics for some really nasty bacteria out there. So every time we use an antibiotic to treat inflammation rather than infection, you are risking that antibiotic not being available to you when you really need it because you're, the bacteria have become resistant to it. So be very careful when you take antibiotics when you really don't need it because someday you might really need it and the antibiotic will not be effective for you. But is there a case where even if you have a cold or the flu that antibiotics are appropriate? And the answer is yes. I'm not, it's on the next, page, next slide. Smokers. Smokers always get antibiotics. Because smokers have all this tar and garbage in their lungs and ash from the cigarettes, they are much more sensitive to getting bronchitis, and pneumonia. So if a smoker comes in with a temperature of 99.8 and a little sniffly and coughing a little bit, even if I'm quite sure they have a cold, they always get antibiotics because it can be very difficult to tell the difference between a cold and an actual bacterial lung infection in a smoker, and they are much more susceptible to having a cold or the flu actually turn into pneumonia because their lungs are weak to start with. People with chronic other lung conditions like emphysema or chronic bronchitis or even kids with, um, even kids with congenital lung problems can end up getting antibiotics when other people might not need them. All right, so that's my good report on when to take antibiotics, when not, and what medicines can or may help you with colds, flus, sinus infections, and bacterial infections of the lower respiratory tract. But now, how can active doctors online help you during cold and flu season? The first way is with our personal health records. Our personal health records are actually intelligent. We can remind you um, if you're due for a flu shot, if it's time for the flu shot, because sometimes as things go crazy with back to school in the fall, you might forget. And with our medication tracker, our medication tracker can tell you which medications, including some of these over-the-counter medications, might be interacting with each other or might put you at risk with your medical condition so that you can know which over-the-counter or even prescription medications are a good idea for you and which ones might not be such a good idea. In addition, with our online second medical opinion program, if you do have a serious lung problem or are just concerned about some element of your health, you can get a second opinion online from some of our top experts in their field around the country and around the world. And finally, if your doctors participate in our e-consultation program, you might even be able to talk to your doctor about your recent respiratory infection over the internet rather than having to come and sit in a, in a waiting room full of other people sniffling and coughing. And it could contribute to making you get better quicker and stay healthier, especially during the winter months. With that, I'm gonna pass it back over to Caitlin who can go over some other elements of how Active Doctors is working for you. Thank you, Dr. Zahalski. 
At Active Doctors Online, our vision is to educate, engage, and empower our members to take control of their health destiny to save time, money, and even lives. We hope you enjoyed today's presentation, and we invite you to start a 30-day free trial of Active Doctors Online. Simply head over to our website, www.activedoctorsonline.com, and click Get Started on the homepage. If you would like more information about the webinar or you have any questions about the services, please feel free to contact Dr. Zahalski or myself directly via email. You can also reach us on social media at Active Doctors on Twitter or on Facebook and LinkedIn at Active Doctors Online. Thank you, and I hope you enjoyed the webinar.